<clears throat> Taking the average of my clock and that clock over there. <laughs> okay, so uh, what I'd like to talk to you about now is diesel combustion modeling. Uh, we've seen the uh, models used. We've seen some examples of spray combustion modeling. Now I want to talk about diesel combustion modeling. <clears throat> so diesel engines, uh, they are the workhorse of our society. Uh, you see diesel engines in, off, in on highway applications, marine applications, power generation, locomotives, off-highway vehicles, uh, stationary vehicles, pumps, and so on. Um, so, really, this is the engine that has built everything you see around you. Uh, the world's largest engine, right? The Wartzella uh, engine. Cylinder bore almost a meter. Uh, stroke almost three meters. Speed, 77 RPM. Amazing engine. Um, Professor Calgati is going to tell you something very interesting, I think. Uh, he has just published a paper, and the reference is here. He says that the container ship Benjamin Franklin carries 4.5 times 10 to the 6th. That's a million, four and a half million gallons of fuel. If you thought, well, let's switch to batteries, the battery pack that would hold that amount of energy weighs 5.8 times the ship's dead weight tonnage and it would take two years to charge at a rate of 10 megawatts, which is not inconsequent. That's the whole neighborhood's power. Right? So, you know, diesel engines are going to be around for a while. As long as we ship containers around the world, certainly this isn't going to be done with batteries. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to tell you about some diesel combustion modeling that we have done. Um, just to uh, give you an idea, of some of the regimes of combustion that will be of interest. These simulations were done uh, a few years ago. Uh, we used Kempkin for the heat release. In other words, we assumed a well-stirred reactor in each computational cell as one of the uh, methods of, of solution. The fuel chemistry was handled with a reduced n-heptane mechanism. Uh, flame propagation was also considered by using the G equation, even for diesel combustion, and I'll show you about that. Spray models, we used our engine research center models, including the gas jet theory to reduce grid, grid dependency. I mentioned that yesterday. Collision, breakup, all of those models. Uh, and then for the fuel properties, we used tetradecane because it has uh, physical properties <coughs> similar to diesel fuel. Uh, to save computer time, we assumed that we could do a simulation in just one-sixth, I think it was, of the combustion chamber because if we had a six-hole injector. Uh, and that's what the computational domain looked like. Um, so the engine is uh, Cummins uh, N14 diesel engine. It's situated at the Sandia National Labs. Uh, it's instrumented with a glass piston and glass optical axis on the liner. So you can see the combustion process in great detail. Uh, the combustion event was also visible through an ex one of the exhaust valves was replaced with a window. And then using the Bowditch piston arrangement, we could look up through the glass piston, looking with OH cliff uh, and also natural uh, illumin luminosity emission. Um, so these experiments were done by one of my students working with Mark Musculus at the Sandia Labs. Uh, the engine is uh, almost uh, 140 millimeter bore, 2.3 liters displacement, 10 to 10.7 to 1 compression ratio. However, uh, that's to try to keep this glass piston intact. But the conditions at intake valve closure were chosen in such a way that your results at top dead center look similar to those you would see in a 16 to 1 compression ratio engine. Fuel injectors, common rail. Uh, sorry, it was eight holes, not six. So uh, an eight hole nozzle. And yes, yeah, some of the parameters, almost 200 micron nozzle diameter. 
So that's the experiment. And the experiments were done to simulate three types of of diesel combustion, conventional or high temperature combustion, which has a short ignition delay. In other words, as you start injecting the fuel, very shortly after that you see ignition. Uh, and then a medium ignition delay, in other words, a case where the uh, combustion starts toward the end of the injection. And then a long ignition delay, one where the combustion starts after the injection is finished. Um, the, in order to achieve these, the oxygen concentration was changed from no EGR to uh, somewhere around 60% EGR. Engine speed was the same for all three cases. And the engine power, we tried to get it to be roughly the same, but it's around four bar IMEP. Uh, to change the uh, ignition delay, here you see the temperature was reduced of the intake charge such that uh, at top dead center, the temperature for the medium ignition delay case was 800, whereas for the high temperature case was 100 degrees higher. Uh, the long ignition delay case is achieved by basically having less oxygen, right, more diluent. Um, some of the other parameters are shown here, the injection rail pressure, start of injection timing. Uh, these two cases had similar start of injection timing. This one was a very early timing because it has a very long ignition delay. Uh, these other cases had relatively short uh, ignition delays. So those are the three cases that we studied. And they're shown here in cylinder pressure versus crank angle or time. Uh, this is the high temperature combustion case with a short ignition delay. Uh, here's a compression stroke. Here you see the fuel starting to inject at somewhere around seven before top dead tender. Uh, and the heat release curves obtained from the pressure trace as I described to you in the first lecture. You can see evidence of a premix burn followed by a diffusion burn. Those are the experiments, the solid lines. The dotted lines are the model. Uh, and you see they give pretty much the same result whether you assume that you have a well-stirred reactor in each computational cell and ignore chemistry turbulence interaction, and whether you use the G equation model, which accounts for potential flame speed effects due to uh, turbulent chemistry interaction. And the results are very similar. Uh, this case here shows the uh, high temperature combustion with the medium in ignition delay. And you see here the injection rate and then the combustion starting near the end of injection. And then finally, the long uh, ignition delay case, the low temperature combustion, here's your injection, and then there's this delay, uh, and then you have uh, combustion occurring. And even though the uh, computational results are slightly different than the experiments, they're good enough we think, to be able to establish the trends. So here you see some of the experimental results. Uh, these are the OH PLIF. Um, and with care was taken to make sure that you're actually looking at OH uh, in those experiments. <clears throat> um, the square that you see here is kind of determined to be the region of the chamber that was uh, where the measurements were confidently made. This is the piston uh, bore a piston diameter, the outer diameter of the piston here is where the injector is located. So you're spraying from the left to the right in each of these images. Um, and these are the time, I guess, these all OH flip, I guess these are the time, the crank angle times, are they? I don't know what those are. But anyway, here you can see the pictures uh, of the experimental data. And then here are the two simulation cases uh, at the same times as in the experiment. I'm going to go through those in more detail, so that's why it's not that important what those numbers are. OK, so let's look first at conventional diesel combustion. We have compression. We inject the fuel. That's the green curve here. Uh, and after some delay, we get a premixed burn spike, and then followed by a diffusion burn. And the results you see here in the simulation are the, are the simulation results. I'm stopping here at the blue line, three degrees before top dead center. The blue is the liquid, and the light blue here is formaldehyde. So you see we've had vaporization, and we're starting to go through that low temperature pathway leading to uh, the formation of formaldehyde. 
by three degrees. And that's before any kind of major heat release occurs, as you see from the heat release plot. If I now go a little bit further in time to around the peak of the uh, heat release, and I'm just going to focus on one plume here, which is the same plume seen from the experimental data here. Um, so this is at uh, uh, one degree before top dead center. Now you can see the formaldehyde in the interior of the jet. The red here is acetylene, soot precursors, and the green is OH. And you can see pretty much the uh, the concept that John Deck showed in his uh, uh, early experiments of a lifted flame that's not at the nozzle, it occurs downstream of the nozzle, and it's filled with uh, pyrolyzed fuel or partially oxidized fuel, the formaldehyde showing that here, and the uh, initial soot precursors, the acetylene, and it's surrounded by a sheath of OH, just like in his uh, deductions from his experiments. Actually, his experiments were done in a very similar engine to this one. And if you compare that with what the OH cliff shows, you can see this outline of OH similar to that in the calculation seen in the experiments. I think this might have to do with some uh, resolution number factor. Uh, here we are at the end of the premix burn spike and you see pretty much a very similar setup to what we saw uh, peak. Uh, again, very similar looking picture uh, right at the end of the premix burn. <coughs> now we're at the peak of the diffusion burn, and you see that the <coughs> um, we've reached the wall of the piston here, piston bowl. Uh, you don't see much evidence of the formaldehyde, but there's a lot of soot precursor material uh, within the jet. Uh, he has the liquid that actually even penetrates beyond the liftoff length. Um, and again, the experimental sh results show the OH cliff here, which basically looks similar to the experiment. And this is uh, at four degrees after top dead center where we've had significant wall impingement uh, and the spray is now starting to spread, or the burning is starting to spread along the piston bowl wall. If we look at the actual dimensions involved here, we see that the diffusion flame is one to two millimeters thick, and that's similar to what's seen in the experimental uh, results. So going back to John Deck's picture, we see pretty much the same things that he saw. Uh, we see the uh, region of soot precursors, uh, pyrolyzed fuel, or partially burnt fuel, and we see soot, uh, in, in particularly in the, in the soot precursors in the uh, head region of the jet, and then the thin OH sheath around the jet. And we see the liquid length here. So this is right at the end of injection. Okay, so uh, just to blow up those results and look at them in a little bit more detail, uh, here we're looking at the results uh, around the, the peak uh, of the uh, diffusion burn. The gray that you see here is the uh, calculated OH. Uh, the blue is the liquid uh, that's vaporizing and providing fuel to the burning jet. In this case, the colored lines that you see here correspond to um, the G equation solution and the equivalence ratio along the G equals zero surface. And you can see that on the inside of this uh, region here, the equivalence ratio is high, as you might expect, because in the interior here you have lots of fuel, very little oxygen. And on the outside you see low equivalence ratios corresponding to lean uh, mixtures. Um, and near the tip here, where the flame would be anchored, you see equivalence ratios close to unity. In other words, a stoichiometric type of mixture. Um, if you look at the turbulent flame speed that's used in the G equation here, you see it's pretty much zero everywhere except right here at the tip, where it has a value uh, of around 150 centimeters per second, which is what is required to keep that flame sitting there, right? So basically, the G model helps you understand a little bit about this uh, uh, 
uh, edge flame or triple flame structure near the liftoff location. Um, and it's the, basically the only region in the jet where the G equation uh, predicts that you'd have uh, any flame speed at all. So <coughs> that's uh, an interesting uh, result. That basically, you can use flame propagation models to calculate the combustion in a diesel engine because in a diesel engine, most of the combustion is occurring as though it was a well-stirred reactor in the flame zone. All right, let's look now at the low temperature combustion case. Uh, here we had the injection during compression, 22 before we saw that. And then there's a delay, and then there's a single spike, more or less, uh, of heat release. Um, so here you see the liquid injection. Uh, and we stop at the point after injection is complete. And we're looking at the kind of first stage combustion process. Here you see this significant formaldehyde uh, appearing inside the jets. Uh, the blue that you see here shows that the liquid is almost vaporized away. If we continue and look at the peak of the heat release, uh, we see now significant amount of OH inside the jet. Uh, very little uh, first stage combustion products, the formaldehyde. And we see soot being formed the precursors, I should say, being formed along the bowl wall here. If you compare that to the experimental data, and again, uh, this is the region where they felt like they had uh, confidence in the experimental data, they saw as well OH filling the entire cross section of the jet. So that was uh, a very interesting comparison. Uh, and that continues uh, as, as you look further out in time during this, uh, the end of the combustion process. So basically, this type of combustion, you can see, looks more or less like HCCI combustion, right? Where you have a single explosion, if you like, where uh, the precursor species, the, the aldehydes and so on, formed in the first stage combustion, then transition to second stage combustion. And that's the final frame. And if you compare this qualitatively with the uh, Sandia low temperature combustion model, you see many of the features there. The precursor species, the formaldehyde, uh, the OH that fills the cross section of the jet, I guess you see that here, and then uh, soot precursors uh, at the tip of the jet. Okay, so this just summarizes the simulation and experiments for each of the cases that uh, we looked at. Um, and let's just discuss them a little bit. The high temperature combustion had a short ignition delay. If you looked at the uh, thickness of the diffusion flame and compared it with the OH cliff, it was about the same. Um, the medium ignition delay case, these flames appeared to be kind of thicker, and that's also supported by what was seen in the measurements. And in the low temperature combustion case, the OH actually filled the cross section of the jet. That's also seen in the experiments. So increase in reaction zone thickness really corresponds to the amount of time there was for mixing. Uh, so here we basically have uh, enough time that we essentially created a premixture of fuel and air. So I said that's kind of like HCCI combustion. Whereas over here, we have mixing controlled combustion. The flame structure is captured without having to consider subgrid scale turbulence chemistry interactions, and I, I showed you that on the previous slide. The ignition occurs in regions that are premixed in, bus in all cases, uh, and combustion is controlled by diffusion and large scale mixing processes. In other words, the, the uh, rate with which you entrain gases into this region is what controls the combustion process and the mixing. So to summarize, the reaction rate dependence on injection generated mixing, which we saw here, decreases with increasing ignition delay. So if the ignition delay extends past the end of injection, combustion generated mixing dominates 
injection-generated mixing. So it's the combustion, basically, is what uh, filled the jet with OH in that case. Um, one of the interesting side effects or side findings from this work was that the OH um, predicted OH mass fraction and the predicted location of equivalence ratio contours were uh, aligned quite closely. So in other words, if you measured OH mass fraction, you could use that result to determine the local equivalence ratios. Uh, so that's uh, kind of an interesting uh, fact that could be used in a diagnostic um, uh, of, of, of diesel combustion or, in fact, low temperature combustion as well. Um, <clears throat> so that's something that we've seen both experimentally and also now in the uh, simulations. Okay, so let's look at in a little bit more detail at the combustion process itself. What I'm plotting here is a bunch of things on one plot. This is <coughs> a crank angle. The line you see here, this uh, green dotted line, is the injection rate. And we saw for the high temperature combustion, short ignition delay, that combustion kind of started just after the beginning of injection. Uh, the various plots here show, for instance, the blue is the heat release rate curve, showing some of the, the premix burn and then the diffusion burn. The red line is the fuel consumption rate. So even though you haven't had much heat release, you've been consuming fuel. And that's because the fuel has been converted into formaldehyde and other fragments of the fuel before you start to see significant heat release. The curve that you see in black <coughs> is the characteristic mixing time of the turbulence. So um, you'll see that uh, in this case, the uh, injection process is basically generating mixing which is what's uh, getting the combustion process going and, and in training the, the fresh gases and getting the combustion process going. So that's the case for the uh, high temperature combustion short ignition delay case. The initial reactions occur in a well-mixed zone on the periphery of the jet. And that's what we saw over here, for instance, if we look at the peak in the uh, heat release rate uh, we see that structure, right? We've got some first stage uh, combustion products in the interior. We've got our sweet precursor species here and then the OH sheet surrounding the jet. And the mixing uh, that is occurring that we're discussing is the mixing between this fuel and the oxygen here. And that mixing is controlled basically by the turbulent um, mixing process. Um, as we saw, there's a kinetically controlled premix spike followed by a mixing controlled energy release segment. Turbulent mixing due to the injection remains visible throughout the uh, energy release. That's this curve here, the black curve. So we're generating turbulence with the injection. And if you go back to the, one of the first slides I showed you when we spoke about combustion regimes, I mentioned that the turbulence time scales came from the nozzle diameter and the injection velocity, and that's supported by this result. The reaction rate is controlled by the rate of transport of reactive material into the reaction zone, and that mixing is due to turbulence, turbulence generated by the injection. If I look at the medium injection, uh, the medium uh, ignition delay case, what we see is ignition occurring near the end of the injection. So again, the red, uh, big button, the green dotted line is the injection rate. We started back here. And we're looking at the crank angles after the start of injection. And now the blue, which is the heat release, uh, is kind of confined. Uh, the major part of that is uh, kind of confined uh, near the end of the uh, uh, injection. However, the fuel consumption rate you see occurs, starts occurring and growing even before the heat release. And that's once again due to this uh, pyrolysis of the fuel creating the 
uh, first-stage combustion products like the formaldehyde. Uh, if you look at the injection-created turbulence uh, through the, the mixing time scale, you see that the injection creates turbulence, and then as the injection winds down, that injection-created turbulence starts dying away. But at a certain moment, you enter the second-stage combustion process, and now you see significant uh, mixing time that is associated with the expansion of the gases that ignite. Uh, you can see that from the heat release here and from the fuel consumption rate. So, in other words, what's happened in this case is we've moved away from timescales being controlled by the injection to timescales that are now influenced significantly by the uh, combustion process. So you see one peak in the, in the turbulent timescales associated with the, uh, the injection and another bigger peak even associated with the combustion process. So this second spike in the mixing is due to the expansion of the hot product and it occurs after quite a lot of the fuel has already been consumed. So now let's finally look at the low temperature combustion long ignition delay case. So again, here's my injection rate. And you see that the peak in the blue curve, the heat release, occurs way after the end of uh, injection. We generated turbulence during the injection, and it really didn't do that much. Uh, we do see some formation of uh, fuel decomposition products from the fuel consumption rate. Uh, the turbulence mixing is dying away. And then at this point, we suddenly see the second stage combustion leading to fast mixing timescales and high heat release. And of course, the fuel is consumed. So the heat release occurs rapidly and is, has nearly completed by the second spike in the mixing. Uh, which is this point here. So turbulent mixing appears to play a secondary role to kinetics for this case of long ignition delay. And as I said earlier, you can think of it this way. You're in injecting the fuel, it's got lots of time to mix with the air. So basically you have kind of like a, a homogeneous charge compression ignition uh, situation where you're just waiting for the chemistry to take over and that happens after the end of the injection, uh, as shown here in, in this particular experiment. So that led us to question, uh, how important is it that you model all of the details of the spray process? We've, we've seen that the spray is controlled by the injection rate turbulent mixing, injection rate controlled turbulent mixing for the uh, conventional diesel, and it's controlled by chemistry for the low temperature combustion diesel case. So let's uh, take a look at this, at this question. How important is it that you model those spray processes that occur uh, within the spray, subgrid scale, we spoke about them at the end of uh, yesterday. We spoke about, turbulent, uh, about droplet breakup, atomization breakup, droplet collision, coalescence, droplet evaporation. All of those processes are occurring in the spray, but do you really need to consider them if the combustion process is controlled by mixing? So one of my students, uh, Zhang Yu, Yui, looked at this question, and what he, he looked at was, what if instead of modeling a spray, we say at a given point in the jet, we have a certain amount of liquid, and a certain temperature gas that has been entrained into that cell, what is the, the uh, equilibrium composition of liquid in the liquid phase and in the gas phase in that cell? So he calls this the equilibrium phase model. And basically, it was inspired by work of Dennis Siebers, who showed, using a very simple model, that he could match a tremendous amount of the data at Sandia by using a couple of simple formulas. One is the amount of air that's entrained into a diesel jet, shown here in this red color here is your diesel jet. The amount of air that's entrained into that jet is proportional to the air density, the fuel density, the diameter of the injector, the injection velocity, and the position downstream from the injector. 
times the tangent of the half angle of the spray, right? So that comes from just gas jet theory, really, uh, uh, that's been known for many, many years. So that's the mass entrainment of ambient gas. The mass flow rate of fuel is determined by what came through the hole here, your fuel density, the area of the nozzle, diameter squared, and the injection velocity. And so if you look at any particular station, the amount of fuel and air, by taking the ratio of these two, you find that there's a linear dependence of the amount of liquid or liquid length on orifice size, because the D here cancels with the D squared, and that the liquid length is unaffected by injection pressure. In other words, the velocities cancel. So that basically says that you can predict the liquid length uh, for a, a diesel type injection process that's mixing controlled without having to worry about anything really to do with the atomization process, the breakup of the droplet, the um, collision and coalescence of the droplet. All you need to worry about is that you've satisfied these, these constraints. Okay, so if you go back to Siebes' model and look at it in a little more detail, he's got the uh, ratio at any particular position downstream of the nozzle of the fuel and the air in terms of a parameter x here, that's the distance, um, normalized by the fuel to air density, a constant, the diameter of the nozzle, and the spray half angle. And a particular point, which is when you're at the tip of the, of the uh, jet, in other words, just at the point where all the liquid is vaporized, you can show that the mass of fuel and air at that location is given by this parameter B that depends uh, on the equilibrium temperature, pressure, uh, uh, and the initial fuel temperature. So B is the ratio of the injected fuel and entrained ambient gas at equilibrium. And you combine all those results, these model results together, you get the liquid length is a constant times uh, proportional to the diameter, another constant here, the spray angle, the fuel density, air density ratio, and then this thermodynamic parameter. This equation, Dennis Siebers and his colleagues at Sandia sh has shown, matches an incredible amount of data on diesel sprays. However, uh, it's something that uh, we've really not looked at much in terms of CFD modeling. So, hence, uh, Zong Yu's model. The idea of this model is that <coughs> we inject the liquid like we did before in the form of Lagrangian droplets. And the only reason we do that is because that way you can get the liquid into the computational domain without having to uh, track uh, the, the vapor uh, which would require very fine meshes. So having the liquid droplets injected into the domain uh, helps you um, avoid using very fine meshes. And we convert that liquid that's been injected, these little droplets you see here, we convert into Eulerian liquid and using uh, the local equilibrium conditions, convert some of that liquid into Eulerian vapor. So basically, if you look at a picture of the, of the calculation here, you have your flow field, your entrainment going on. Here's your injected blobs, if you like. We don't have to worry about the size of these blobs uh, uh, or the breakup of them. They just are markers, if you like, for injected liquid. Uh, and then we convert that injected liquid into vapor, calculating the local equilibrium uh, conditions that would determine how much of this injected liquid is in the liquid phase or in the vapor phase. So here's the uh, equation that we use to track the Eulerian liquid phase. So remember, we injected Lagrangian drops, and we're now converting them into Eulerian liquid phase. So here's the liquid phase density, Eulerian liquid phase density. Uh, time evolution, convective term, diffusion term, and then there's two source terms. First source term is the phase equilibrium solver. How much of this liquid at a particular location in space and time is converted uh, using phase equilibrium to vapor? And then 
And the last term is what we call the liquid jet model, which is basically the only model uh, that, other than uh, you know, equations of state and so on, that is needed. And this one tells you the rate with which you should basically convert your Lagrangian droplets into Eulerian liquid. Uh, and it's uh, structured in such a way that you guarantee that all of the liquid has been converted by the time you reach the liquid length. So using Siebes' formula, we say that this parameter gamma here, which goes from uh, 0 to 1, um, is the mass of air that's been entrained at a particular position x divided by the liquid length, uh, beyond which there's only vapor, right? And we use Siebes' formula to determine what that is. So this parameter gamma is equal to 1 at the point where there's no more liquid. When this is one, uh, your uh, uh, mass of the liquid parcels goes to zero, or the rate of change goes to zero. OK, so that's the model. Now, as I mentioned, there's two source terms. One is how fast you convert the, the, Eulerian liquid into, uh, the Lagrangian liquid into Eulerian liquid. And the other is the rate with which liquid is converted to vapor from the equilibrium solver. And so here we have a very elegant uh, equilibrium solver that Lu Chu, one of my students, wrote that basically does a phase stability test by looking at the mixture in a cell and deciding how much is of that mixture is uh, liquid phase, how much is gas phase, uh, and, of course, this doesn't necessarily require that you have only one species. You can do this with a multi-component mixture. You can have some parts of the mixture converting to vapor, and you can actually have some parts of the vapor converting back to liquid, uh, all as determined from the sta phase stability test. Uh, and then there's a phase split calculation, which splits the results into the liquid phase and vapor phase. So the phase equilibrium solver is, allows us to capture the distinctive phase behavior of pure species as well as for mixtures. And it depends on the thermodynamic states and the equation of state. And this just shows one example from Lou's uh, thesis where he was looking at mixtures of N-hexadecane and isooctane. Uh, there's just a phase diagram, pressure, temperature, space. Uh, let's just pick one case, this blue line here, where you have a 30% mixture of uh, hexadecane, 70% isooctane. Uh, the triangle shows the critical point. The dotted line shows uh, the, uh, our, the beginning of the vapor phase, so the liquid is to the left. Solid line shows the vapor phase. And in between these two, from the dotted to the solid, you have a mixture of the two phases. Notice that for the pure isooctane, the critical point is over here. For the pure uh, hexadecane, it's down here. And so by having the two species mixed, you actually have critical points that are uh, uh, different than either of the critical points of the species in this particular calculation. So the, uh, and that's known also very well uh, in the literature. To, to get these calculations going, we need equations of state. He uses the Peng Robinson equation of state that involves, uh, the, for each species, the critical temperature, the critical pressure, uh, an eccentric factor, and also uh, some other parameters uh, uh, taken from the literature. So, for instance, here we have, for a case involving dodecane, uh, isooctane, and heptane, and various gaseous species, we have the critical conditions, the eccentric factors. With all of that, we can then calculate uh, from the pressure, temperature, volume relationship, the conditions that we need. OK, so just to talk about the spray calculations then, uh, and just to re remember the models that we've discussed, what he uses is the uh, GRNG turbulence model, which accounts for flow compressibility and has flow coefficients that are functions of the, flow, the local flow strain rate. Uh, this actually gives improved predictions for compress compressible flows. 
We use SpeedChem, which is an analytical Jacobian approach with sparse solvers for the chemistry. Uh, basically, to speed it up, we also use tabulation of temperature-dependent thermodynamic properties uh, rather than, than uh, solving quote, um, polynomials. The chemistry mechanism, uh, the, there are several here for n-heptane. We use uh, 109 species model, dodecane, 100 species. Basically, all of this is in our uh, multi-chem mechanism with NOx and then the PAH models all the way up to pyrene. Uh, Semi-detailed soot model I told you about today. We have soot all the way through pyrene, soot surface growth with acetylene, and soot oxidation by oxygen and OH. Okay, so the cases that uh, we looked at are those uh, engine combustion network spray cases, cases without any oxygen, so there's no combustion, and then a bunch of cases with oxygen, with combustion to predict uh, soot. Uh, the injectors are located here, 0.5 degree sector mesh, 0.7 by 0.7 millimeter resolution. Uh, this, uh, the calculations that he did also included radiation, but I'll just mention that here. Wall temperatures are 450. So uh, I don't know why it's not showing, but there used to be a movie over here, but I guess we don't need to see it. Uh, this is the predicted penetration of the vapor cloud and of the liquid uh, for the conditions that we discussed before, 900K ambient. Uh, density 22 kilogram per meter cubed and injection pressure 150 megapascal agrees very well with the experiment. Here are the ca uh, calculated profiles of fuel at cross sections uh, downstream of the injector. Uh, here is the comparison with the center line mix fuel mixture fraction. Uh, you can see it agrees quite well with the experimental data. The profiles at two, three, four, and five centimeters are reasonable, uh, considering that we are not modeling the spray at all, right? There's no spray here at all. We're simply saying we're converting liquid to its local equilibrium value at each position. And by a certain distance, there's no more liquid, it's all vapor. And <clears throat> this is the resulting combustion for the cases that have oxygen. 15% oxygen, roughly. Uh, here's uh, one doesn't have EGR uh, for various temperatures: 850, 900, up to 1,000. The experimental suit uh, is shown in contours here in parts per million. I guess that's up to 12 in the red parts per million. And as we saw before, at low temperatures, you see much less suit than you see at high temperatures. The, the liftoff length is calculated. I'm sorry, this, this is the experiment. The liftoff length is shown by the dotted line, but here's the calculated. And you see the correct trend uh, in, in, in most cases. So basically, uh, what we conclude from this comparison is that one can predict combustion and even soot uh, for these sprays without having to spend the time modeling the spray. Diesel sprays can be thought of as an equilibrium process. That's because the mixing is controlled by the turbulence generated by injection. On the other hand, if we're looking at low temperature combustion, that's controlled by the combustion uh, chemistry. So it looks like you can avoid the spray altogether. Well, that's not exactly true. For example, we've done some work with Ford where we're looking at cold starting, okay? And here, we're injecting uh, early injections uh, into the combustion chamber uh, during the intake stroke. And here you see uh, a little bit later, and eventually near top dead center, you still see liquid, evidence of liquid that has impinged on the walls. Uh, so there will be certain uh, applications where you still need to model the spray, make sure that you um, can track cold start, for example, and where the sprays are likely to accumulate during wall impingement. So to summarize then, what I've 
like to say is that CFD modeling can be used to describe both diesel and spark ignition combustion characteristics over a wide range of conditions. Yesterday, I showed you spark ignition engine work, and I used the G equation to calculate the flame propagation. Today, I showed you diesel uh, combustion simulations that also use the G equation, as well as the well stood reactor concept, and it worked just as well. So basically, uh, this is uh, an important conclusion. Diesel, which is mixing controlled and premixed combustion, is adequately represented by, uh, without requiring modeling of subgrid scale turbulence interactions. Now, they are occurring and are modeled in the G equation, right? The G equation accounts for the turbulent flame speed, which is determined by turbulence chemistry interactions. So, uh, in a way, you don't have to model that if you can provide some sort of uh, estimate of the turbulent velocity. And we used Peter's formula for that, if you remember from yesterday. The effect of turbulence on combustion is satisfactorily modeled if we use the integrated G equation based combustion model with detailed chemistry. Uh, we've actually given this model a name. We call it the gamut model. <laughs> the G equation for all mixtures, a universal turbulent combustion model. And we have a bunch of papers that you can look at uh, if you're interested. Probably the most interesting conclusion, though, of our recent work is this statement here. High pressure diesel sprays can be modeled as an equilibrium process. You don't have to model the atomization process details, the breakup, the collision, coalescence, the vaporization. Those are all non-equilibrium processes. And it turns out that by uh, using our um, equilibrium phase model that I just described to you today, all you need to have as input is the angle, the spray angle, the tan theta over 2, which you can get from correlations in the data. And uh, that's it. There's, uh, you need the injection velocity and the, the diameter of the jet, which I showed you last time you can get from cavitation models. So it's a very simple model with very few experimental, required experimental constants. However, more research is needed to determine when this approach can be safely applied. So we have a paper coming up at the ICLOS meeting in Chicago at the end of July, where we show we can use this model also for gasoline sprays. Uh, uh, we're using it for a GDI application. And the results are surprisingly good. No accounting for any of those non-equilibrium spray processes. So here are the references for this uh, segment of the presentation. So we have time for questions. Yeah. Uh, so I am wondering the the arrow introduced by the grid and arrows introduced by the data temperature, whether I just some of you whether it's uh, worth to use data temperature. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, you know, it's an issue of what is the characteristic mixing time. If the uh, fuel and the oxidizer are well mixed at the resolution of your grid, then you don't really need to worry about gradients of fuel and oxidizer within that computational cell. So now that's where those turbulent time scales come in. If you can track the turbulent time scale, assuming that they're calculated accurately, and show that you have enough time for mixing such that at that scale, everything is, the assumption of homogeneous mixing is, is OK, then subgrid scale effects are not going to be that important. Right. Now, having said that, that's an approximation, right? I mean, you know that soup particles are going to be forming uh, where it's located a little richer, or the temperature is a little higher in that computational cell. So we're talking about averaging in, in these types of simulations. Uh, and I guess what I would suggest is you try running the same 
simulation with different mesh sizes and see whether the results change. We've done, for instance, the, the spray calculations that I showed you back here on all kinds of different meshes and found we get very similar results. As long as we don't go too fine, remember I mentioned that if your mesh becomes too fine, then we've got to solve different equations than the ones that we're solving here. We have to solve equations that account for the volume fraction occupied by the liquid in each cell, which is assumed to be zero in standard calculations. All right? Yeah? Would it be fair to say that the uh, stretched out uh, first stage ignition and later rich combustion in low temperature combustion, that that is in high temperature combustion sort of compressed into a thin reaction zone, and then post that reset reaction zone, there's more and more soon for Yeah. In fact, if you look at those pictures that um, I could find them, I guess, the John Dick's uh, image and Mark Muscular's that's exactly what they what they show. So uh, remember we said that the actual turbulent flame consists of laminar flamelets and that it's not possible to resolve down to the laminar flame dimensions in a practical CFD simulation. So instead of trying to resolve the details of the chemistry and the, the uh, wrinkled flame <coughs> small scales of turbulence, you instead say, well, I'm going to use the turbulent flame speed to represent all of those processes. They are turbulent chemistry interaction processes that are all embodied in your formula that you use for the turbulent flame speed. The turbulent flame speed is the flame speed you use in the G equation. So in a way, this statement is not exactly right. 
um, you are modeling the stuff good scale to the chemistry interactions, but you're doing it in a way that is very simple. You, in, you're specifying a turbulent flame speed. Instead of trying to calculate all the details of those little laminar flames wrinkled inside the foot frame, flame brush. All right? So it's a shorthand way of doing it. Fred, do you have a question? I'm, I'm trying to resolve some of these thoughts in terms of some of the other things we know about elementary chemistry. And I'm, I'm having difficulty with that. And uh, perhaps you can help me. I'm, I'm trying to understand what you call first stage and second, and second stage combustion products. If I have a mixture in a PSR <coughs> and it has hydrocarbons that are paraffinic or aromatic or anything other than some very small oil pens, those hydrocarbons suppress the oxidation of carbon monoxide and carbon. So I get an energetics that's a fuel plus oxygen going to essentially CO and water. And then I have a second stage once that fuel has become very small, and I can almost calculate what that number is by saying summation of RH plus OH for all of those species relative to CO plus OH is the ratio of the average rate constants for KO plus OH. And that works extremely well, except for acetylene, ethylene. Okay. So when I look at these stages, the first stage has got to be heat release. It's associated with CO to water. But there's going to be a second stage heat release that's CO to CO2, which is large here because of the mole fraction structure that we're dealing with, right carbon number. And then finally, in that region, I'm going to have that transition with olefinic species that are part of your soot. So the, the PSR concept here is defining something relative to that that may be different than what I would see with the plug flow reactor. So that's my one question, just trying to understand. Second question I had was, there, there's always been this thing raised by DEC early on that Everybody else had diesel models wrong for years until Sandia measured the right one. And it's always bothered me that statement because everybody else's models were from the 50s and 60s with injection technology that was extremely low pressure and unrefined in comparison to the present. Basically, what that's referring to is the difference between where I can only go, I can go directly to your equilibrium vaporization model, where now the surface area produced by the droplet size, whatever its distribution, is so large that the entire system goes to equilibrium very easily locally. The one where the droplet sizes are bigger now, and the total surface area created is now constraining the vaporization rate, which might have been the case in 1960. Mm -hmm. and is that not the transition issue that you were talking about before? And it sounds like it's not important now because I've got an atomization so approved for even GDI that it's not relevant. Yeah, you could be you could be right. Um, when when he first proposed his model, it was very controversial, and I think the unique part about it was uh, in, in the picture we just were looking at a minute ago. Um, Oh, sorry. Just adding on to that, one last point. Uh, well, that, that when I'm talking about the turbulence produced by the injection, would I have expected that in 1960? That turbulence, that the injection was really producing the turbulence and the lot was coming from the intake process? I'm not sure. I wasn't there. It would be. Yeah. 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 I just don't know. Yeah, I think I think people did recognize that the turbulence from the injection was controlling combustion mixing. Uh, like in a gas jet, I mean the gas jet uh, turbulence is controlled not by the environment but by the injection. Uh, but I think your point is the vaporization process is quite different. I'm trying to get to this final picture here. Yeah, this one. The part that was new in his work is this. 
you know, people yeah. thought, oh, you went from liquid to fuel, so this whole interior here was vapor fuel. And they ignored this little flame there. There's a standing flame. That's your cool flame. That, I think, was what people finally recognized was new by John Dix. Uh, Are you sure it's a cool flame? Well, that's what they call it. I mean, it's, it's, if you look at the temperature profile here, this is a very small increase in temperature across that plane. So you basically, this, the equivalent to the first stage combustion, and it could shut down, you know, due to NTC, for instance, right? and then start up again in the second stage. So if I were to define the species production along that center line, what would I find for that cool, for that? First plane is you're telling me I find hydrogen peroxide. Yeah, all of the and, and CO, um, but no basic. I'm not sure about CO. Uh, I think CO would come later in the second step. That's my guess. Seen that Actually, calculation we've done? Yeah, no, I think I, I think I agree with you. No, no. Randy Hessel in my group is looking at uh, diesel jets, and he basically sees the. The entire jet is filled with CO. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, that emphasizes the importance of the CO plus OH reaction because that's what's going on to create the diffusion plane. Yeah, no, you're right. Well, the coupling drop of burning we've done says that that first stage ends by the formation essentially of CO and some water, mm -hmm. right? And but lots of hydroperoxides and partially oxidized species. And then I go into hot ignition conditions, and there the peroxide is decomposing. I start to get fragmentation of the decision. Now the whole issue of what's controlling the OH formation changes. Because the HO2 is no longer coming from the hydrogen peroxide. So RH was original. Yeah. I'd love to see some speciation profiles in your general. That's I what they've been asking me to do uh, at San Diego. It's extremely difficult. So yeah. now we're doing simulations for them. And it would be but you've done that in the simulation, yes. Yeah. And, but I haven't seen any of the publications for that distribution. Yeah, stuff. I can send you some stuff when you're we'll writing a paper right now. But I think this drop issue that Rob was mentioned is extremely important. We've done so much, or I shouldn't say we, the industry has done so much in improving atomization principles over the last 15 or 20 years. That just isn't. It doesn't seem to be what we all thought it was. Yeah. It still is in gas turbines. Okay. It just isn't. Here. As I mentioned to you the other day, I mean, my problem has been Dennis Seifers has got these correlations that are based on math <laughs> that work, and he never spoke about truck size or any of the stuff inside a spray. It's just uh, liquid lift and spray angles. So why am I calculating right up with droplets and <laughs> so anyway, it's interesting that it seems like there is a regime uh, where we're in mixing is really determined so fast uh, by the turbulence. Uh, the uh, characteristic times for ionization, breakup, and vaporization are so short that they will be guaranteed. Okay, uh, let's meet in 10 minutes.